Good morning. Uh, good mo sorry. 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 Good, sorry, mo Jackie. good morning. Um, welcome to this morning's general licensing subcommittee hearing. Um, we've got the councillors on the line. Um, Councillor Atwell, Councillor Adrian Pegg and Councillor Rob Cooper. Could I just ask for nomination of a chair? Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Councillor Atwell, please. Thank you. Uh, and I'll second that. Thank you. So Councillor Atwell is chair for this meeting, so I'll hand over to chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, first of all, before we start today's meeting, um, obviously we will all be aware of the recent sad passing of His Royal Highness, uh, the Prince, the Duke of Edinburgh. As we find ourselves in a period of official mourning, it's only appropriate for us to join together now in one minute silence so we may reflect upon His Royal Highness's lifetime achievements um, for our nation. very much um, everybody in joining us for that one minute silence regarding the death of the Duke. Uh, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome um, to today's General Licence Committee on the 16th of the new 2021 regarding the crossbar. Um, um, any apologies? Uh, Jackie, is there any apologies to yourself? No, I've not received any apologies, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, a late items to be introduced by the chair. Uh, there's none by me. Is there any declarations of interest? I have no declarations of interest other than the norm, chair. Thank no. you, Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Councillor Beck. Um, okay, um, application for the premises license at the crossbar. I think it's over to you, Anne. Thank you, chair. Good morning, everyone. An application for a new premises license has been received from Chelston Leisure Limited for the crossbar Chelston Park, Snellsmore Lane, Chelston, DE 736TQ. Officers have delegated powers to deal with applications where there aren't any relevant representations. However, this is not the case with this particular application, and that is the reason for this hearing today. The application from Chelliston Leisure Limited was received on the 22nd of February 2021. A copy is attached to Appendix 1 in the committee report. During the consultation period, we received three relevant representations from other persons. These are attached at Appendix 2. And we also received some comments in support of the application, and these are included at Appendix 3. During the consultation period, the applicant agreed license conditions with Derbyshire Constabulary. The associated email outlining those conditions is attached at Appendix 4. The application is for the supply of alcohol for consumption on the premises. Uh, it's from Monday to Thursday, 1100 hours to 2330 100 hours, Friday, 1100 hours till midnight. Saturday, 10.30, 100 hours to midnight, and Sunday, 10.30, 100 hours to 23.30. There was, um, I noted in the report, there was a slight typo on the Sunday hours, but we ha had, did get clarification that they meant 23.30, 100 hours, as in half past 11 at night, not in the morning. The proposed designated premises supervisor is to be uh, Simon Fisher. And the committee has an obligation to have regard to the Licensing Act 2003. The national guidance issued under 
that Act, the Council's own licensing policy and the Human Rights Act 1998. So, the options for committee today, they can decide to grant the application um, as, it, it, as it stands, modify it, or reject the whole of the application or part of the application. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Chair, you are on mute. Sorry, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Anne. Um, is it over to the applicant now to make his uh, representation, Jackie? No, it's witness first. Uh, witness people okay. make, pay, making representations. Okay, who's who have we got first? I would suggest calling guest one. Yes, guest one, if you're ready to go, please. Hello, I'm guest one. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Sorry, what was your name again, please? Uh, can I remain anonymous as okay, N, if that's okay? Okay, okay that's Thank fine. Uh, I've submitted a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if all parties have that available for them. Obviously, I'm going to be discussing the slides, the photographs, and the information and the points raised. Sorry, I'll, I'll cut in there. That, that has been distributed. I can put that up on screen now if you want to talk through it. If you could, that would be wonderful. Thank you very yep, much. Bear with me a second then. Great. Obviously, that's the intro page. Could we go to page one? Hi. Oh, right. Let me try again. Still not appeared? No, not yet. No. Do you want me to just carry on? Uh, obviously. Give it one more go. Okay. How are we doing now? Lovely. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. This is the cover page. Could we have slide one? It's disappeared again, Ducky. Oh. Brilliant, right, I'll start. Um, so I'd just like to welcome everybody. Obviously, I appreciate this is a licensing application. However, it is important to consider the big, bigger picture, the impact the bar will have, and the issuing of the la alcohol license on the local community, the park users. Um, uh, obviously, this is going to increase the amount of visitors to the park. So uh, considerations need to be made about access points, impact it has on local residents, the concerns that they have, and existing um, antisocial behaviour and concerns already. As you can see from the PowerPoint presentation, Chelliston Park has got a pavilion building. That's the building highlighted with like the red roof. Um, and you can see that the main access point in the car park is from um, like a local road leading out of the village. If you look at the southern point, the south of sort of left hand side of the picture, you can actually see that is quite a built up commercial area. And that is where the other access point is. Um, I do feel that there's a significant amount of investment being made around the pavilion building and the area. And it's great to see there are three G pictures within the pavilion building. And obviously, the bar would enhance the services available to the users of the pavilion. The three, D, the three G pictures are highlighted in the other corner. Obviously, this has helped lots of local youth groups and has been seen as a welcome addition to the park. 
However, um, as you can see from, like say, the bottom side of the picture, where it's densely populated in a residential area, there has been no investment at all. This is one of this is going to be the main access point because of the local area. No investment has been made in that area of the park. Um, there's no CCTV in that area. There's been quite a lot of antisocial behaviour and concerns about access, which I'm going to go into. So for those of you that don't know the area in the park, this is just to highlight an idea of what an aerial view looks like. Could I have slide two, please? So obviously the four main concerns, the first one being prevention of crime and disorder. Obviously, uh, at the end of the day, that is a primary consideration for this application being granted. I do feel, oh, can you see the presentation still? My screen has gone blank. OK, I'll carry on, I'll carry on. I do feel let down um, the fact that this area has had no impact that has had no investment. Like I said previously, there's no CCTV and no adequate lighting. So after dark, it, it is literally pitch black. You can't kind of see where you're walking or around the park. The top end of the park where the pavilion is, you've obviously got the amazing lighting from the 3G pictures and all around the car park area. But none of that has been um, invested in at all to the other end of the park. Obviously, I, um, I'm one of the local residents that lives immediately um, imminent to that access point. There has been a history of vandalism, fires, both in the trees and surrounding area and of objects. There's been broken play equipment, quite a lot of large groups loitering on benches and swings and slides in the play area, which again is at that south access point. And I do feel that if, you know, there was sufficient lighting, CCTV, that that would prevent this behaviour from reoccurring. It is a constant, constant problem. And I do feel that the granting of the licence will encourage more visitors. And I do feel that the littering, the loitering and all the problems that we have currently are going to escalate. Also, I feel that we then may also have drunken and disorderly behaviour. And that will also become another issue for local residents who live near that that main access point in the south. You can see from the photos some of the vandalism and behaviour that we've had. Um, I know in this presentation, some of the social media photos have had to be removed, so I have to talk through those. So just to sum up that slide, I don't believe that granting an alcohol licence will prevent crime and disorder. I feel it will only add to and escalate the current issues that we have already on the park. Could I have slide three, please? So this is just talking about public safety. Um, obviously, access to the park and the bar is going to be a concern. The main area at the south of the park, which is one of the main access areas, is off Fellow Lands Way. There has been a new housing development which has um, been completed in the last few years. Obviously, that has increased the local population. This is encouraging more visitors to the park, um, and the developers did create like an extra path to allow like a new access point um, to one side. But this has not been finished, and the path just leads to a load of trees. And if you look in the PowerPoint in the bottom, left hand corner that's kind of the path to nowhere um, this encourages visitors to cut through the trees and this has caused damage to the trees the fences it's also quite unsafe there's lots of bricks and debris you can see in the top right hand corner and rubble so anybody who is kind of venturing through the trees into the dark where there's no lighting is likely to cause harm a lot of people from the housing estate and the residential area don't always walk all the way around to the entrance. They are quite often cutting through these trees. This is immediately in front of several properties and again has caused noise and disorder 
um, particularly late in the evening. And as the park has become more popular, this has led to Fellow Lands Way and the main park entrance becoming like an endless row of parked cars. And you can see from the top left hand picture, that's a photograph taken from Fellow Lands Way. It's it, that's from the speed hump where you would cross the road to get into the entrance. As you can see, there's just a tremendous amount of cars that seem to be there on weekdays, evenings, weekends. And I think people that are using the park are parking there. They're not necessarily driving all the way round to the car park. They are parking there and it's causing quite a lot of um, congestion. Local residents find it very difficult to see to even cross the road. And if you look at that picture, there is an oncoming car coming down the road and you can hardly see that it's there. There's only one traffic calming um, platform that is there. I do feel that it would benefit from others, but that's a different matter. So as the bar is going to increase visitors to the park, I do feel that, again, this is only going to be highlighted and make the problem worse. Whilst, you know, the car park is a huge car park, it is at the other entrance. And because that's not as heavily populated, quite a lot of people are either going to walk or, or drive to this, this point and then just walk from here on. Um, and I just feel it's clogging up the local residential area with loads of parked cars and issuing of an alcohol license will just create more new problems. Um, again, focusing back on you know, the fact that people may drive there, leave their car at that entrance point and decide to maybe walk home. This could again cause disordered conduct, loitering, um, and particularly around that access point area, which again is in a heavily densely populated um, residential area. So to sum up, I do feel that granting the license certainly will not, would cause concerns for public safety in lots of different areas that I've highlighted in the presentation. Could I have slide four, please? Um, so this is looking at prevention of public nuisance. Um, just a little bit, again, history for people who may not know the park. During the last 18 months, we've obviously had, um, well, since last March, we've had lockdown. Um, during this period, obviously, we've had changes in government regulations on our use of outdoor space. There has been a significant number of breaches of the lockdown regulations. I know myself personally and other people have reported lots of incidents and there were several photos included in this presentation, but the legal department removed those yesterday. Um, obviously, for legal reasons, some of the participants in those photographs may have been identified. So that's why they were removed. Um, so including groups, um, playing sports, meeting up large groups of 10 or more, um, people having family meetings and barbecues in the park. And the, the police really did absolutely nothing. And I re it was reported in the correct way several times over several weeks and these were reported as an ongoing daily basis and all the response we had was the fact that they're they were simply being logged so i'm quite extremely disappointed that the police aren't actually part of this meeting because obviously this is a concern um, at the end of the day you do find that some of them were drinking alcohol there was bad language there was antisocial behaviour. And this isn't a good example on a public park where there are a lot of children. There is a children's play area that overhear this type of language, observe this type of behaviour, and it's not really very appropriate for children to be hearing, modelling, observing that kind of behaviour. Um, there's been very little or no local support from the police and incidents just go really, um, you know, like I say, on a reporting log with nothing being done. I've used the park on a ba daily basis for many years and I have not seen any police presence or patrol and I visit the park quite regularly um, and I don't see anything. Again, the bar causes for concern for some of the behaviour. Um, I think um, there is, if people are going to be buying alcohol, 
then this could promote um, people excessively drinking on occasions, which could cause offensive behaviour. If there is going to be an outdoor seated area where there is potentially Sky TV or football being screened, again, people are going to hear the noise and that is going to obstruct them for being able to use that park to their own enjoyment, because that is going to be um, impacted by whatever noise is coming from the bar and certainly the overspill from people coming and going to and from the bar and whether that's going to be done, um, you know, in a polite manner with, you know, thoughts about the local residents. And again, um, policing their own noise and their noise pollution. Um, already, the 3G pitches do have matches that go on till quite late in the evening. In fact, last night, there was a football match going on until 9.30. And, the, you know, I appreciate it's a football pitch, but it is 9.30 at night. And to still hear people shouting, over me here, and all the... All the football, um, you know, all of the ins and outs of the game were being shouted and repeated and voices carry at that time of night. And you could certainly hear it in my property in, in, in the back garden. So um, the fact that there may be a bar opening until 11, 11.30 midnight is, is just going to excel that situation further. Personally, I would like justification today on why it needs to be open for such long hours and over seven days a week. And certainly I would like justification on the uh, rationale for serving alcohol. You can have um, a facility available to buy food and drinks. That's fantastic. However, does it need to involve um, alcohol? Because that will literally heighten the problems that we have already on the park. So again, in summary, I feel granting the license to sell alcohol will definitely increase public nuisance and antisocial behaviour. And the incidents we currently have on the park are just going to escalate further. Could I have slide six, please? So protecting children from harm Obviously, I work in education myself. I support local charity work for parents and carers. Um, obviously, we have been in lockdown. I, I have children myself. I feel that sports and clubs is a fantastic way to learn new skills, make new friends. Obviously, the bar is part of the pavilion. We've got the 3G pictures. I know that the cricket club is now going to be using um, the, the same facility. And it's great that there is that community feel and facilities and services available. Obviously, sports and clubs for children are very important. They learn new skills, make friends. But while they're there, they need to feel safe and they need to feel happy. Um, and now we are coming out of lockdown and all of these clubs are starting to reopen. You know, this will help children's uh, mental health and well-being. I think we all have to work in partnership to ensure that we protect children from harm and we have a duty to all it's everybody in society to make sure that we save, safeguard our children um, for parental responsibility obviously parents individual boundaries and expectations do vary but it is important that um, you know that any sporting activity takes place that it is with the safety and well-being of all of those that are involved and it needs to be taken really seriously and for me the one key aspect out of those part five p's is paramountcy the needs of a child must come first that one individual point alone the needs of a child must come first is having an alcohol license putting the needs of a child first no it's not I don't feel that children observing their parents drinking or other people drinking, you know, we want to set a high moral standard, try and encourage our children to not associate sports with alcohol and some of the behaviour that that can materialise. So for, for me, I do feel that, you know, this will have an impact on our children. 
those 3D picture, 3G pictures do have football clubs with an awful lot of children that attend. And I just don't think we need to have a bar. And that is, it, it, it's something that I feel will certainly, you know, encourage our children to be hearing bad language. And on the occasions I've been to the park on where there are matches, there are adult matches on the grass pitches. I've observed bad language, swearing, shouting, aggressive behaviour, abusive behaviour, and people like urinating in trees, in the bushes and things. And I, I just feel that having a bar added into that is going to escalate the situation further. And certainly thinking about our children, like I've said previously, having an alcohol licence is not putting the needs of our children first. Can I have the next slide, please? So finally, um, this is the final slide. I just wanted to um, express, first of all, my concerns about the bar and the process. I do know that, that again, some of the slides, some of the photographs I did put onto the presentation have been removed. There has been quite a lot of, um, Personally, I feel that everybody should have freedom of speech. We should be allowed to have our personal opinions. However, the reason that I am anonymous, like my, like other people that may be presenting today, is the fact that there's been an awful lot of um, trolling on, face, on, on, on social media. Um, some of the local, one particular local councillor has made it quite clear that to use a quote in one of his uh, comments on Facebook, just so you are all aware, I'm all over this like a cheap suit, which um, concerns me that this is not a fair process, that, you know, potentially there has been some councillors who are um, actively involved, um, you know, in, in progressing with the application going ahead. There's also been the same councillor um, suggestions were made that anybody who did object were to be outed at the local fete and in stalls so they could have wet sponges thrown at them. And again, he found that fairly amusing, which is extremely disappointing that, you know, at no point, um, you know, as anybody with an unbalanced view, I think, I think outing people in the community is an absolute disgrace that he is, that that councillor is behaving in that way. And I've certainly taken that matter further because I don't feel that, you know, that that is warranted. At the end of the day, we should be able to have our opinion. And the fact that I don't agree has been by a very justified argument with um, problems we already have on the park. I would like to know what the council's commitment to the park projects is moving forward. Um, I also would like to know what the review process is, if any license is granted, how long is that for? Um, if there is persistent noise and antisocial behaviour and the fact that this could become, um, you know, a magnet for trouble, um, at the end of the day, is it, how is that going to be reviewed and what processes are in place? And also, if an equality and diversity evaluation has been uh, undertaken, obviously there are ethnic um, groups within our society and some of them may be um, unable to use the facilities that are in the building if alcohol is being sold. So those are my first questions for the council. Um, and their their leasing, uh, their licensing department and their parks department overall. And then I have direct questions for the proposer. So did you want to answer those questions first or do you want me to go on with the proposer questions? If you could just, I uh, guess, one, just carry on with your presentation, uh, first of all, please. Right. OK, so for the proposer, obviously, um, I want to know what the vision is for the bar. What 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 is it going to look like? What is going to be in there? Because it's all been um, quite cloak and dagger, really, about what it's going to look like. I understand that they are 
you know, adhering to what the public demand may be. But is it going to be a sports bar with Sky TV everywhere and on every weekend or weekend during the sports seasons of various types uh, and encouraging this to be not a community bar, but a bar that is likely to promote, you know, um, people visiting on a, a social um, basis to be able to, you know, be watching. I don't want to live opposite a Sky Sports bar that's open from seven and from very early in the morning through till midnight every night. Um, again, I, I can't see that any. I'd like to know what process has been used to consult local residents. Obviously, we've now had indication today of what days and times and a basic timetable of use, which is helpful. Again, I've requested a justification for the sale of alcohol. Um, and um, there is a note um, that some noisy events are likely to be planned. Well, what noisy events are they? How often are they going to be? What are these noisy events? Are they uh, bans? Are they? You know, I don't know. You know, we just have a huge lack of information around this bar and about what it is actually going to look like, be and how it's presenting itself to the public and local residents. Is there any external security involved? Um, whilst there is lots and lots of security at the top end of the park, the south end of the park, where the main entrance is, there's no CCTV lighting, anything at all. So any problems they have, you know, are they just going to be moved further down the park and therefore cause problems to the residents at the other entrance where there's a lot of um, residential, where in the built up residential area. Obviously, what is the um, complaints process for noise pollution? You know, I know they're policing that themselves. However, you know, they don't live in the immediate vicinity. Um, are they going to perhaps appreciate this from the local residents' point of view? I wanted to discuss that further. Um, what areas are they responsible for? Where are their boundaries for um, being able to manage the bar? Um, you know, uh, because again, whatever problems may occur are just going to spill over onto a, a public park basis, which quite clearly the police currently don't respond to. And with no lighting and monitoring of CCTV, it's unlikely that, you know, that that is going to put make sure that this stops. That would certainly be a deterrent. And any plans to consult with local residents on a regular basis, just to ask them, you know, how have you found it? What, you know, and ask for their points of view. So that is my presentation. And obviously, there's questions there that need to be answered for the council and the proposer. OK, guess one. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, OK, can we have the second guest in, please? Hi, all. Um, I don't have a presentation, um, but I strongly agree with what guest one has uh, presented. Um, so there's no need for replication. But I do have a question, some, some questions. I mean, my one of my biggest concerns is, is by granting this license, what's going to happen to my children's sleep? We sleep with the windows. We've had a difficult 14 months with COVID, missed out on plenty of school. With this license, if it's granted and, and the hours that are proposed, they're not going to get a decent night's sleep. It's bad enough now with the noise from the 3G pitches. What controls are there over noise? There's going to be an outside pavilion area. There's going to be an outside smoking area. And for those of you who drink and socialise in pubs, you'll know outside can get quite leery and loud, especially later on at night when everyone's had a few. So do do. My children, myself, the residents, you know, local residents, don't we deserve a good night's sleep? I have to get up early some days to travel. I travel all around the world for my work. I have to drive hundreds of miles. 
I need a good night's sleep. I can't be a risk to other road users, be tired, and with the potential of falling asleep at the wheel. My children should be able to study, go to school, fully refreshed with a good night's sleep. We shouldn't have to close our windows because of the noise. We have the right to a good night's sleep like anybody else. It's, this will affect everybody's mental health. Second point being, by granting the license, the alcohol license, you are going to alienate certain ethnic minorities from using the park facilities. There are certain religious, religions and beliefs that do not want to be around alcohol, don't want to see drunken behaviour, rowdiness, and nobody's saying it's going to be drunken all the time, but you're eliminating that public open space from a lot of people. Chelliston is a multicultural society. And for the prevention of crime and disorder, how will granting the alcohol license prevent crime and disorder around Chelliston Park? It may well do around the pavilion and the car park, but as guest one has clearly pointed out with the rest of the issues around the park, how will that happen? In my opinion, it's only going to encourage more because you're going to get more people doing what they've been doing. And how, how, do, you, how do you clarify who's responsible for that? The individuals? Is it coming from the bar? Have they been to the bar to get the drinks? I know there's, they're going to be served in plastic cups, etc., etc., etc. Again, my children use the park. They use the sporting facilities there and are part of some of the clubs. But I don't want them to, to think and believe that sports and alcohol goes hand in hand. I mean, if you look at F1, you look at football and other sports, they're actually actively encouraging no sponsorships from alcohol, cigarettes, etc, etc. So how do we justify granting a license where this will all be going on, where children play? At the end of the day, this park should be available to all, regardless of colour, religious beliefs or background. And I'm, I'm going to leave it at that for the time being. I mean, uh, just to add, I believe you would have had a lot more objections, a lot more people coming forward had the, uh, the vitriol one particular lady received on social media when she just asked a question. Her address was virtually outed by supporters um, of the bar. And what really astounded me was at no point did the applicants who were a part of this po uh, social media post or the local councillor condemn this behaviour. So, I mean, this is on social media for millions and millions of people to see. And it doesn't leave me with much faith of how they're going to control the bar if the licence is granted. And finally, if you do believe that the licence should be granted, I don't think it needs to be until 11, 12 o'clock at night. Most sports, cricket matches, football matches are done by 7, 8 o'clock in the evening. I understand there's 3G football pitches, I understand there's people playing football, but you know, the local residents, the local children deserve the right to a peaceful night's sleep. It's their mental health, my mental health, everybody's mental health at stake here, as well as this public open space remaining open for all people of all walks of life, regardless of their religious beliefs and backgrounds. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much um, for that presentation. Um, over to our third guest then, please. Yep, can I get my presentation up, please? Certainly, just bear with me. Yeah, sure.
Okay. Can you just move on to slide two, please? Okay, so these are just the points that I'd like to talk around today. So the reasons for me objecting, um, what I've personally experienced um, being living by Chelliston Park, my concerns resulting from this um, proposal and how the situation has been handled to date. Um, and then at the end, I have listed like some quest questions and discussion points that I'd like to put forward to yourselves and just to understand what the next steps will be from today after that. Can I have slide three, please? Okay, so I've, um, so first of all, I just want to make it clear when I'm objecting, it's not just to be part of the party and join or anything. It is personally what I've experienced by living here. So I bought a brand new build house here and I know there's a park opposite me. Um, I know, you know, people play cricket, they play football. I'm completely not against any of that. However, being here for five years, I have experienced so much antisocial behavior on ad hoc basis, you know, thinking, oh, maybe it's a one off, you know, you don't want to think too much into it. But there's been like late night drinking, smoking in the park. And it is when it becomes out of control and you feel like you can't even say anything, but it affects you in every shape or form. We've got to get up and go to work, you know, even if it's on the weekend, you know, like think it's OK. But these are kids that are out there even drinking most of the time and smoking, you know, and then police constantly coming out, but nothing getting done. I've had a roundabout set on fire opposite me and the flames were so high. Um, it was, I had to actually call the fire brigade out as well because obviously that wasn't gonna be something we could control. I've got my car there parked, you know, you're getting worried thinking if it comes too close because there's not that much of a distance between us and the park. The, the kind of language that is used when you do walk around the park, kids actually smoking, it, you know, it isn't the kind of thing you'd expect. Yes, it's the park opposite me, you know, some level of noise, but my God, I wasn't expecting something like this. It isn't Mark Eaton Park or the big one where you expect festivals and people drinking late at night, you know, and being so rude. This is supposed to be a really nice area. That's why I chose to move here, but it clearly doesn't seem like that. And having the crossbar here, um, it wasn't the kind of thing I would be expecting to be opening up here. You know, next thing we'll know, we'll have shops opening up on our doorstep somewhere as well. We won't even know about it till they've actually actually been put in place. You know, late night parties, late night music. It's all of those things that have been happening here. And even after reporting it, going through the right channels, nothing has been done. So I just don't understand how having the crossbar, thinking that it's going to have a 24 hour presence will actually deteriorate that behavior. You know, you need to first deal with this before you even think of anything else. Can we please move on to the next slide, please? So the other thing which is quite concerning for me and I really don't understand is when the decision was made or the proposal was put forward to open the crossbar, why weren't we as Chelliston residents, um, you know, informed, you know, just so that we could have some sort of a, a public forum? Yes, we're going through a pandemic, but, you know, we do live in the day and age of technology. So why could we, as we are today, having a virtual meeting, why couldn't there be something just put in place just to say, you know what, guys, you know what, this is what we're thinking. Giving everyone the opportunity, if we are part of a community and everybody's, um, you know, like um, opinions and thoughts can be taken on board to sort of say, you know, this is what we're thinking. What do you guys think? This is how it's going to be. What would you think that could benefit this park to deter antisocial behaviour or just to, you know, bring it up in the world a little bit more? What, why wasn't that done? You can open a gym to give 24 hour. Um, there's gyms that could be 24 hours. You know, you could have like snack bars. Um, like, you know, when you're selling snacks, juice bars, coffee places, there's loads of little things that you could do there. And that would be more beneficial than offering an alcohol license. Now, just to be clear, I have got nothing against alcohol or people drinking alcohol. But the issues that I have experienced um, living here and how it's impacted my personal life. Um, and also, it's quite embarrassing when you have family coming around and then you've got that going on in the middle of the night. And so and it's not the kind of thing you expect. If I knew that, I wouldn't have moved here in the first place. But at the same time, I don't appreciate people putting on a message. Well, if you don't like it here, you can F off, basically. And I'm like, well, how dare you say that to me? Why don't you F off? 
you know, who has the right to say that to anybody? It's been absolutely disgusting, the kind of abuse we have had. Um, just to go further into, we've, the other thing that's quite concerning about this for me is, it's like what vaguely we found out and at very short notice, and that was through um, a Facebook group that were here in our local area, that was the only form of communication. I felt like, I, I do feel like we've been cheated a little bit, like, so nothing can be done because everything's already been put into place. You know, these people are part of the council committee or something. All right, fair enough, you guys agree with it. Everybody's entitled to an opinion, but when you're in a certain position, you also should be dealing with the matter in a certain way. And I don't feel like it's been dealt with properly at all. Um, and the other problem we already experience quite a lot. And yes, I know that you know it's a foot, people play football here, play cricket here, but it's not all the time. But when they do play here, they actually block up the road, and they've actually blocked up our drives at times as well. We don't know who that is, and we have to wait. There's no courtesy there, and our roads are quite narrow. So even when we don't have a drive at the front and we've parked up, they park on the other side, and then when people from the more sort of deeper down in the residence come out. They're actually effing and blinding when we go to our cars because they're struggling to get through, through no fault of ours. How's all that going to be dealt with with the parking situation? When Bellway was building houses here and they had the showroom, they actually had a little bit of a um, parking space. And a lot of the residents did actually say that, um, could that be left there just to give us a little bit more parking space, even if it's for people that come into the area, visitors or, you know, that, that they didn't agree to that. They removed that. And in this estate, you know, there's going to be a point where we have to pay for the maintenance of it. And, you know, people, are, there's going to be so much footfall coming through and that's going to impact us as well. Why should I pay for picking up people's um, wastage just from, from the crossbar one or anybody else with all of that? I don't agree with it. And I just don't feel like it's been communicated correctly to us as well. We could have been given a bit more information, given a chance as a public to actually put our views forward and be taken on board and just be constantly communicated with where what the next steps were or going to be. Can I go on to slide five, please? So like I've mentioned before, um, I do feel um, that the situation could have been handled a lot better. First of all, just from a communication point of view, I just felt like the communi could, community as a whole could have been better informed. There could have been a better way to put the information out there so everybody was aware that what was going to happen. Um, and the other problem is I do think that there's two Facebook groups, one which is sort of immediate to us estate and one which is called, like I've mentioned here, um, Spotted Cellist and Self Post. Now, there's so many people on that and social media is a powerful thing. It can be a good and a bad thing at the same time. It's there for a reason, but people aren't using it correctly. And by that, I mean people who have created it and should be the administrators of it are not actually, shouldn't be managing it. Because there's one thing having an opinion, but knowing that you're the person controlling that, you should be able to diffuse a situation if someone's saying something out of order, which then eggs on or fuels the fire for other public members to think it's okay to say. You know, because our names are on there, you're, um, you know, so people can see. So it's been, it has been outright bullying. And I'm not just saying it, I've got evidence, I've taken screenshots. And the worst thing of it is, if someone turns around and says to me now, oh, but that was deleted. Yeah, what happened was it was very, it's done very calculatively. First, you know, you start fueling the fire, you let people say what they want, setting that sort of tone to say it's okay to talk about people like that or to be outright bullying, then delete it. And then guess what? We start the same thing again. And then because you don't like that person, you decide that you want to block them, but it's okay to carry on talking about them. I don't think that should be allowed. And the fact that there's people from the council that have also used those type of tones. I definitely don't agree with that. And it doesn't give me the confidence that we're going to be heard and in the right way channeled. It's almost like this is a, um, a tick in the box exercise that you're doing, but the mind's already been made up. I mean, the work on crossbar is still going ahead. And on top of that, you, the noise amendment that was put in, that was put in after our objection. So it makes me think what information you have put out there what is it actually going to be? Now it's gone to seven days. 
you know, the noise pollution. Yeah, we've got to sleep. We've got to get up and go to work. We've got kids too. You know, where do we stand in all of this? What, what, what does it mean? If we've got any issues, who do we address them to? Will we actually even be heard? Can we take us to um, slide six, please? So, yeah, these are just the questions and discussion points that um, I would just um, like to put forward. So how will the noise pollution be managed? What if the noise pollution is too loud? What is the process to report it? Um, what type of events will be taking place? Security cameras um, will only be covering the pavilion. So, you know, that's if there's any problems there. What happens when that problem goes elsewhere on the park and further out? Um, who is responsible for the security footage and the company? You know, because you can say that, oh, yeah, there hasn't been any evidence since the crossbar one's been there um, of any antisocial behavior. It's actually deteriorated it. But if it's run by them because that's their contract and lease, who's to say it doesn't get deleted? Or where's the proof? Who else will be managing that? Um, the crossbar one um, still seems to, like I said, be going ahead, irrespective of this meeting. Um, it just looks like, like I said to you, it just feels like the work's been carried out like it's a done deal. Um, how will the information about the cross, um, crossbar be communicated after the meeting? And the second part is more or less just me emphasizing again about the abuse and um, that that's been given as a result of speaking out and that person that spoke out didn't say anything rudely it was just a simple question been asked just like we live in a country of freedom of speech everybody has a right to put their views forward be it if they're for it or against it you know yes you can be passionate about one side of what you feel about it but we're adults so why can't we deal with it in the right manner um why do we feel that offering alcohol license will benefit there's so many other activities, like I've mentioned, and I've just put in some examples out here. And how will the safety and parking issues also be managed? And can you just take me to slide number seven, please? And yeah, if I could just um, understand what the next steps will be and how will that be communicated to us and the wider audience, because I also um, share that same sentiment that there are a lot more people that will be objecting than just us. It's purely just because we've, it's not been communicated to us or they've not want to come forward because of how the situation's been dealt with to date. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, um, guest number three. Chair, I just wanted to double check before we move on. Um, do, do the panel have any questions in relation to the representations they've, they've had? I'm conscious we've had three representations in a row there. Um, I just want to make sure that the silence is that there is no questions to be asked of those individuals as opposed to their the opportunity being missed. So I wonder if that could be addressed, please. Yeah, I'm, for myself, I have no questions. Is anybody else, um, Council Group or Councillor, they got any questions? No, no, just like to thank um, those that have spoken so far. Uh, I've got no questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No questions, Chair. No questions, Chair. Thank you very much. I have a question, sorry. Uh, I'm guest two. Um, after can I can I can I just come in there? Um, you've presented your case. Thanks for making the representation. Uh, we will take that into consideration, obviously, once we deliberate. So, unfortunately, there's not going to be any questions that allowed to be asked by yourself. We've took on board your representation, and we will look at it as and when we get to that point, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Chair, thank you. Chair, the only point I would make, there were some speculative questions in those presentations whereby uh, the individuals were asking what would the next steps be and whatnot. I would ask that they contact the licensing team and the licensing yes. team can give them that information at their leisure as opposed to in this forum. Yeah, yeah, just going back on to the point that Lana's made, if anybody's got any questions to put in, please feel free to either email uh, or write into the licensing team at Derby City Council and they'll give you all the clarity you need. Thank you for that one. Okay, I think if I'm correct, and it's over to the applicant now. Uh, Annie, there. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, me. Yes, it will be... Um um the applicant um 
I can answer a few of the queries uh, if you want me to do that now. Yeah, if you could, please. Uh, that the guest one, two and three have made. Okay. Um, obviously, yes, by all means, contact the licensing team. A lot of information is on the licensing website. Um, the review guidelines uh, at any time for any premises license, anybody can put in a review um, and all details and the guidelines on how to do that are on the website. Uh, there was mention of lease agreements um, under the Licensing Act um, that can't be covered under the, the Licensing Act 2003 as it takes no account of whether people have got planning permission, permission to use the, um, the premises or any lease agreements that might, might or might not be in place. Um, events, um, certain entertainments are no longer licensable. So if there is any events going on um, that uh, use recorded or live music between the hours of 8 a.m. and 11 p.m., uh, they are no longer licensable if the capacity is uh, less than 500. Um, any noise complaints should be put through to the environmental protection team. Again, they're on the website, but uh, you can contact, always contact the licensing team and we can point you in the right direction. Uh, there was some query on the process for licensing. Um, the licensing itself is set in legislation and uh, the associated regulations. Um, so when it comes to sort of notification, the requirement is there should be a public notice on the premises. There should be one public notice in a local newspaper, normally Derby Telegraph, and it, they are all listed on our um, website at, at derby.gov.uk. Uh, there was a mention of short deadlines. Again, these are stipulated in legislation and we can't change them. Um, it's not, they're not enforced, not in, um, imposed by the council, they are in legislation. And if need be, there is an appeal process after this meeting. Um, again, we can help you out with that if that is needed. Um, any of the parties can um, apply for an appeal. That, be, that would may be the, the applicant or anybody who's made a, re, a relevant representation. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Anne. Okay, uh, Mr. Fisher, over to you to make your presentation, please. Thank you. Um, is it okay if I call my witness first? Is that okay? Yeah, that's or fine. Go first? It's entirely up to you. Yeah, yeah I'll, um, if Craig can go, that'd be great. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so firstly, uh, I just say thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our, our sort of side of a, the case. Um, I thought what would be useful from listening to some of the comments from the objectors is just to give a bit of background about who we are and what we are. Um, I think firstly, um, I think it's very poignant to make a point that so to say, firstly, we don't condemn any of the abuse, the abuse that's been made on social media as an organisation. Um, we did condemn that on the posts when we saw it happening and said it's not what we're about um, and we've had no part of that. At all times we've been open with the objectors, so certainly the first person that was on, um, we gave her the opportunity to talk to us um, and we've got a conversation on our Facebook Messenger from her where we've given about a lot of the details that she's now questioning. Um, but that aside, so who we are, um, AFC Chelliston has been going for 28 years now. Um, and has pretty much all that time used Chelliston Park as its home base. Um, the former chairman in about 2010, 2011 started having conversations with the council um, to say, could we use the pavilion as our sort of our main headquarters to store things, to use the changing rooms? Because it was only being used at the weekend when the council could send up wardens to open it up. So for pretty much all of the time it was there, it was closed. There wasn't any daytime groups using the facility. Um, so I'd say the former chairman took that on. Um, it took three or four years to come to an agreement. There was a full tender put out to any interested groups or parties to take over the running of the pavilion and the sorts of management of the sports pitches. Um, from what I'm aware, nobody else came forward other than AFC Chelliston, so the tender was successful. In 2017, the chairman, former chairman stood down and myself and Paul, who's the chairman of AFC Chelliston, 
um, took on the responsibility. We're a not-for-profit organisation. We work very closely with the council parks, the te parks team. Um, we get the support of all the three Chelliston councillors. Um, we have, other than uh, the councillors, we have no connections to them. Um, we say we just when we want to try and do something for the benefit of the community, we will try and get their support um, and, and say we do get that from all three. Um, say we're not for profit. Um, we work very close with the parks team. We've invested since we took over in July 2017, 200,000 pounds worth of improvements in the parks. That's the 3G courts that were dilapidated tennis courts that were dangerous, falling to pieces. So we've now got, say, two floodlit 3G courts that uh, we could probably have two or three more. Um, they're very well used by not just Chelliston teams, but teams from around Derby. Um, we've also got, say, that was £100,000 investment, which we got from grants and funds that we've raised. The grass pitches, there's a £66,000 investment being made in those to improve those um, with the Football Foundation. And then the pavilion itself, again, we've got funding and uh, from funds that we've raised ourselves over the last four years that has allowed us to extend the community room um, and put an additional changing room onto the building and actually modernise it because it hasn't been touched since it was built in 1997. And if you saw the state of the community room, it was a tiny, tiny little room that was good for nothing other than serving teas and coffees from the kitchen, which is what we did. Um, we spent £6,000 on CCTV, and I know that people have been saying that it doesn't cover the park, but I believe the objectors obviously haven't seen the CCTV coverage. Um, and again, because data protection, we obviously can't share the images and what range it covers of the park. But there is a very wide ranging area, not just the building itself. And we've also going to have CCTV inside the building. Um, we've worked very closely, again, with the um, neighbourhood police team and Derbyshire Constabulary. And I can, again, I can't share details, but in the last two years, there has been at least two successful convictions of individuals causing antisocial behaviour. I think one of them was publicised in the Derby Telegraph not long ago. Um, so, yes, we do report these things that our cameras pick up and the police do take action. And one of the things that we found in the four years that we've sort of been running the building is that when there's a presence on the park from the football clubs that use it, the 3G, the people that are causing the antisocial behaviour disappear. They don't want to be seen. And that has been proven in lockdown. And we have seen, again, groups of, or groups of people, um, people in cars coming outside of lockdown when they shouldn't have been. But that's because there's no presence and nobody's at the park using it. So when, when the football teams are using it or the cricket team um, and there's people around, they don't like to be seen. They don't want to be in their cars playing the music and they disappear. When they come back at half past two in the morning, that's not something that we as an organisation can be responsible for. Um, there is a suggestion we've asked, could we lock the gate at the entrance to the car park? And unfortunately, the council, they said, yes, we can, but you have to have a team of volunteers that can open it up at something like half past five in the morning and make sure that it's shut at a suitable time at night. And if, if you've ever been involved in the voluntary sector, trying to get volunteers to do things like that is very difficult. Um, CCTV, say over £6,000 spent on the system. It's not just your thing off Amazon for a couple of hundred pounds. It's fully monitored. We're registered with the data protection um, agency as per the requirements. So we have to legally store the data for the required times. And again, the police, uh, when they visited us, uh, they've also set conditions that we have to meet. So as it, even though we're volunteers, we are responsible. Um, for sort of controlling the CCTV correctly. Um, one of the other things uh, that's been mentioned, I think, is the sort of noisy events. I wasn't sure where the noise amendment came into that because I don't believe we've actually made anything on the noise. Um, and I'll let Simon sort of cover more of the inside of what's going to be happening in the building. The 3G hours, I'm just going through my notes that I made while the, the objectors are on. 3G hours, again, we are bound by a, an agreement with the Parks Department of when the courts can be used. Um, so the latest that is is 10 o'clock. And so we, we don't go over 10 o'clock um, in the evening. Um, just looking through. And just on the car parking. So I, again, I sent in some photos and it was a, a sort of late yesterday due to sort of work commitments that I managed to get them to you. Um, but we have about 101 parking spaces at the park. 
and that is very well used. We've also got a couple of an overflow car park and a couple of areas that we can use for parking. Um, I actually went a couple of nights. I've walked past the entrance, the sort of the pedestrian entrance to the park, and the cars that appear in the photos that the objectives were provided are actually there in the evening. So I think predominantly a lot of the parking is caused by the doctor's surgery and residents themselves that aren't using the drives at the back of the houses. Um, as I say, we've got best part of a hundred parking spaces and that is more than adequate for the size of the facility and the football pitches that we have um, and I think that's that's all I've got to say so thank you for the opportunity and I'll, I'll hand back to Simon. Thank you very much. Um, over to you Simon please. Thank you. Um, so you pick it up from Craig I think um, uh, I probably need a little bit of guidance on, on how you want us to answer some of the questions raised because some of them I feel, as Anne has pointed out, aren't necessarily relevant to the hearing today, um, but I'm, I'm happy to answer them if you want. And I think the most disappointing thing for me is that the vision of why we started this, and obviously the vision of what the word was used earlier, the vision of why we started this was to try and, and help and um, relieve some of the troubles that we've listened to today um, and take them away from the park itself. So um, as Craig has described, um, we are a team of volunteers. Um, we are set up as a not-for-profit organization. Um, nothing that we make from this business venture um, will go to ourselves. We cannot take a single penny ourselves. It will all be put back into the community and into the park and surrounding areas itself. As we have throughout the time where we've been in existence, um, we have spent um, a good number of thousands of pounds on good causes um, and everything we have raised through our volunteering has been ploughed straight back in um, to the park itself as Craig's talked about there through things like the CCTV that we have put in to try and reduce some of the antisocial behaviour. So in, in terms of the park itself though, um, if, if we do need to cover that, um, that was the reason why we started this. Um, the building itself was being mothballed, the building itself was being was very dilapidated um, and we took it on because we had to go there on a Saturday morning and a Sunday morning and we had to clear up the litter um, that was left behind. We had to clear up the glass that was left behind from where the park was just being used by by people turning up and youths using it in the wrong way. So what we did notice um, as we started to have some meetings with the council to discuss things like the 3G improvements, that when we were there in the evenings and we could turn the lights on in the building, a lot of the people that turned up just turned around and went back again. So uh, over time, we worked with the council, we, we put our heads together and we said, well, what, what can we do for a vision of this place to make it vibrant? It is the centre of the community um, in, in many ways. And it is such a shame that a lovely building like that was going to waste. So um, we started to think, how could we improve this building? And as time moved on, um, that moved towards a licensed facility. And if I can cover that, I think the reason why we moved down that route, um, as it has been raised, is, is primarily for a few different reasons. But one, most of the trouble arrives late at night. So we've heard other suggestions for use of the building. Obviously, no one has come forward to do any of those suggestions that have been put forward for use of the building. But it needs to be a use that will bring that will be open late into the night to move the trouble away. So sadly, shutting at nine, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, the, the problems will come afterwards. We've seen from time there's been people there at two, two, four in the morning that we've picked up from our CCTV. So the later that we can have somebody man there as staff, obviously will push some of those problems away. But the building itself, I think a lot has been made today because it is a license in hearing on the fact that there is a sale of alcohol. That is not our vision purely. Our vision is to make this a, and you'll see from our logos that we've put out, we'll make this a community and a family friendly environment. Our licensing application said exactly the same thing. So our bar, for instance, will not sell things like shots um, because we will not encourage um, bad drinking behavior. We won't have drinking promotions um, and we will have very strict controls over who can buy alcohol, um, very strict on a challenge 25, very strict on where they can drink within the park. Um, we are putting up railings and patios, again, at our cost to distinguish the areas of where it is OK to be OK with alcohol and where it's not. Um, and again, we were not allowed a takeaway sale of alcohol because we're trying to make sure there's a clear distinction between the park and the building. Um, so as the crossbar, we are very much interested in that building. So we also are looking at daytime usage. We have spoken to various different dance groups. We've um, had meetings already to via third parties to speak to um, the scouts and the, the, as well, because we want to try and create a community hub. 
But to be able to do that, we need to be able to pay for things like um, improvements to the area. So covering off for um, people there to clear up if there are troubles when we're not open, people there to make sure that we are covering our CCTV costs. We are covering the maintenance. We are going by to clear up where we have any antisocial behaviour in the area, because despite the park being outside of our boundary itself, that's what we do offer as an organisation as to we see ourselves as somebody who is, is trying to make that area safer. So um, throughout the daytime, we will have mixed use. At the moment, our application will cover most of the day because for an, a, a licensing application, that's what you need to do. We have been very clear um, throughout this process that once this is granted, we will speak to the community about what is required. So we've already spoken to the local residents association to say, would they like to be able to use this facility? What would they expect from it? How would that look potentially around a lunchtime? We spoke to various members of the community to say, what would you like to receive? Um, and just to pick up a point earlier in terms of the advertising and the social media, because I think that is a big point. And I think that is something that's been really disappointing for us. So as soon as we place the license application, as Anne pointed out, we've done everything within the regulations um, at great costs. Um, but we've done everything within the regulations and, and how the legislation tells us to do that. But from day one, we then advertise that fact further because we were conscious of the fact that putting a poster up within the legislation and putting an advert into the paper might not be picked up by everybody else. So we shared that ourselves on social media to say this has gone in to open the consultation period and the licensing request has gone forward. That was where I believe our guests actually picked that up from, from our own social media post to say that. Throughout that time, we've done nothing to say to people, please make sure you come forward and support this. But there has been a lot of support for it. But in, in terms of just something that um, I really wanted to pick up of in terms of um, social media posts. So we did actually, um, actually in my name, put forward a post ourselves to say, please, everybody, be fair. Everybody deserves a voice. It's not right to therefore um, use the majority to go after and uh, attack the minority because they have a different view. So that's something we've been very conscious of and we have gone out of our way to try and make sure that that is being done. And as Craig pointed out, we did invite people to come and talk to us. We've had various different people come and talk to us. It's been obviously very tricky with lockdown and everything else that's gone with it. We've gone out of our way to welcome people to the facility to say, come and have a chat with us. We'll tell you what we're trying to do. We've actually showed people around in the last few weeks as well, but we'll show you what we're trying to do and we want to take your input on board. Um, and if there is an opportunity for people to shape what we're trying to create, then fantastic. So in terms of the, the vision, going back to that, it will be there to support. I think having a licensed facility near a sports club is a very common thing throughout the whole of the UK. Um, we've got we've gone out of our way again this year to invite a home cricket team because we want to make it a use that brings the community together. So we've moved the full cricket club over to, again, try and make sure there's regular cricket where people can get together. And if they want to have a, have a drink or a bite to eat or whatever while they're there, having a licensed facility gives them the options to be able to make the choices that go with that. So um, throughout the daytime, again, there will be food, hopefully. But all of this is based on what's going to be viable. We're a not for profit, as I've said. We will be taking on employees to run the place. Um, and to do that, we will only be open when there's a demand for us to be open. But we will be doing that in a, in a responsible way as per the licensing rules and as per every, all the communication that we've had with the police throughout the whole of this process. Um, and we will continue to do. But in terms of probably the biggest concern I heard from residents today was around noise. Um, I think most of the other complaints that I, I listened to today were, were the things that I actually share in terms of what we're trying to stop. So various other behaviours around the park. Obviously, we can't control whether developers put a footpath in somewhere and we can't control whether someone buys a house next door to a park. But the thing that concerned me was noise. But I would say that in terms of whether you look at, at licensed facilities, in terms of actually proximity to the nearest residential house, there, there won't be many in this country that have a bigger prox or bigger distance between the, 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 the venue and the, the local, the nearest local house. But we will be making sure that as part of our obligations, we will be controlling that. And obviously, one of the questions was raised, well, as the designated premises supervisor, my licensing conditions that have been put forward state that I have to be available if there are noise complaints at all times. So that that will be part of that process. We will we will work in an and adhere to that guidance throughout um, and, and we will manage this in a, in a responsible way because 
we want it to succeed. Um, it has been raised that there will be um, bans and other events. Again, we're open to anything, but we've never suggested that. That has never been suggested by us. It's not our intention. We don't have any intentions to have noisy outdoor sports playing on TVs. That's never been suggested by us. Everything we want to do wants to be centered on a family feel. Um, we looked originally at things like a pool table, in, uh, even to the detail we've gone down there, and decided actually, is that the most family friendly, welcoming way, or can that cause rowdy behavior? So we moved away from it. So in terms of our facility, it's a very simple facility. Um, indoors, um, it's fully professionally set up, but we have freestanding furniture because we want to be able to remove it to make it a multi-use facility. So again, if somebody wants to hire it out, they can do. But simply, without a licensed property, that without a licensed facility there, this place will not be able to survive. Um, and it will not be able to survive as Chelliston Leisure because we need to be able to bring in an income to be able to, to run the place with the amount of staff that needs to be done in a professional way to make sure that the place is safe. So we've talked there about having multiple staff on site to make sure of safety. That's something we're looking to do. We're looking to go down a route of minimising cash on site for safety. Again, that's something we're looking to do. You need to be able to invest in those things and we need to be able to, be able to invest in them professionally. So as a team, that's what we've gone out of our way to do. But if we were to close early, we believe we are not going to solve the rest of the problems within the park and within the car parking area. Um, because as I said, we need to be able to drive those behaviors away and they tend to, especially at weekends, those people will turn up um, once they leave somewhere else um, or, or later into the night once they feel it's dark. So um, uh, there was a few other complaints. I'm not sure if I need to go into more one by one things like CCTV. Again, it's part of our license and object of objectives that we, we have to make that CCTV available. If we don't, we lose our license. It's simple as that. So um, we're very aware of that. We've taken the courses that we need to do. We'll continue to do so. We'll continue to keep all the logs that we need to do. We voluntarily gave the conditions to the police officer that we would have no glass outside. We would we would not take drinks beyond the patio, all those sorts of things. We voluntarily gave all of those conditions and we were completely open to throughout that process um, to try and make sure that this is, is safe and successful. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, like I said, whether you want me to go through the rest of the points raised um, or, or whether we feel that's needed. Um, just to reiterate, really, from our point of view, our main our main goal throughout this process, through giving up our time um, that we do for free, our main process is to make it a safe, family friendly environment. We, we are all part of the football club. We have 50 teams, boys, girls, all ages as part of this football club. It's grown from, I think it was 23, Craig will be able to correct me on this, but the numbers is 23 about three or four years ago. It's grown significantly because we've gone out of our way to encourage families. As part of that, Chelliston Leisure's put on fun runs, it's put on open days, it's put on all sorts of family friendly activities. And that's what we will continue to do. We will continue to push for. Um, but in order to do so, in order to make this successful, as I said, we, we do need to have a licensed facility to give people the option to have, have a drink in a, in a responsible way. Um, and that will be part of our role to manage that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Um, has anybody in the panel got any questions? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Rob Cooper. Uh, Mr Fisher, um, could you just talk through uh, the proposed opening times uh, and um, can you explain why uh, you, you want them for the hours that you've suggested, uh, especially the, 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 the uh, closing times, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so for a, from a day of the week, obviously, I think um, on a weekday, it was 11.30, which is a a fairly standard closing time, I feel. Um, but a, a weekend, we just allowed that extra half an hour um, till 12 o'clock. Um, the reason, as I said for that, is we've seen when the trouble can come to the park at a weekend and it will come later. So what we didn't want to do was invest even more money into the, into the facilities and then close earlier. Um, and the problem doesn't change. Um, it doesn't go away. All it does is leave even more investment there exposed to be to be to be damaged but what we won't do is we won't push it if we don't feel we need to um if we feel that actually we can close at 10 30 of an evening and there'll be no one there then we'll choose to do that 
Um, and we'll look to do that. But what we have to do as part of this process is, is meet the objective of what we're trying to do, and that's drive the antisocial behaviour away. And while some of it is, is younger children that may go early, some of it was cars that come late at night. So as a facility, we need to make it, I say vibrant, but we need to make it safe. Um, and if we close earlier than that, um, then we're not convinced that that will allow us to do so. So we, we put the hours on there to give us that option. Um, but again, it will come down to what the community feel is needed. Um, if we feel the community says, actually, this isn't working, um, then we'll, 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 we will look to close early. But what we have talked about already is um, if necessary, um, and again, it was part of our, our feedback from the police, if necessary, we will, we will bring on um, professional security staff um, if we feel it's needed. We, we sincerely hope that it won't always be needed because it's a family centric venue. Um, but if we feel it's needed because shutting at midnight attracts more people um, after a certain hours, then we will bring that on board and we'll say that you have to be in before a certain time. Could I, could I please just add a bit more to what uh, Simon's just said? Um, it also, just on the opening hours, it gives us the flexibility to sort of offer different things. So you start early in the morning if somebody, and again, just some, picking something out off the air, if somebody wants to do a, a wake after a funeral, that might be earlier in the day. Again, you might have somebody that wants to use the pavilion for a presentation evening or something, and that's later at night. So one of the things that we've also done is work with Melbourne Sporting Partnership that have got a very similar facility. Um, and we've pretty much, in terms of opening hours, spoken to them and modelled ourselves on them. So same setup as a pavilion, sports pitches. They've got a, a bar that's available to the public. So it's just about, again, on top of what Simon said, it's the, the flexibility to just to allow us to do different things. Um, Councillor Pegg, any questions for myself? Uh, yes, Chair. Just bear with me a second. Um, yes, Simon, thank you for um, talking about noise and how you want to reduce noise. But I'd be great if you could expand how you actually would go about reducing noise if there was a problem and just generally exp expand how you prevent public nuisance. Okay. So in terms of what we're looking to achieve, um, uh, I, I say this and I, it's, I don't want it to appear trivial because that's what it would, but one of the things that we, we look to voluntarily start with will be around signage. Um, but I'm, I appreciate that that won't always take that away, but it's a good start as to where we go from. It's something we talk with the, with the police on their visit to, to have appropriate signage reminding people to behave in the community and to leave respectfully. Further to that, one of the things that obviously we've, we, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to have full time staff at this location or paid staff at this location. Obviously, at the moment, it is voluntarily on a voluntary basis of people that are there when they can to sell teas and coffees and those sorts of things. So we want to be able to generate income and create a business proposal where we can have staff on board that will have managerial roles that will oversee those conversations with anybody who's using facilities to remind them that when they leave the premises, they do so in a respectful way. So it's not just relied on reading a sign. If people aren't doing that, it's very simple. We are not there to, to as I said before, it's not about getting as many people through the door as we can. We've limited the amount of people that can't come to the building to 60. Um, we very much would say if you cannot leave in the right way and you do cause any concerns and that does come back to us, then those people will be asked not to return um, and they, they would not be allowed to return. They will go into the refusals log with everybody else. Um, so we will do everything we possibly can from that point of view. Um, but it's it's about a community. It's about trying to make sure that we're all in that together from that point of view. Yes, we are running a professional facility. Yes, we have paid staff, but it's it's there for Jelliston. It's there for the people of Jelliston to use it in a responsible way. And if they can't do that, then they won't be allowed to use that facility anymore. Um, if there are if there are initiatives that have worked elsewhere um, that can add to that and help to that, then absolutely that is our objective to go out there and find out what they are and talk to people and say, what ideas did you come up with? But from our point of view, I think um, taking away drinks, promotions, um, encouraging responsible drink and all those sorts of things will we'll support that and add to that, um, as will our careful management. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, is there anything for myself, Lionel?
Okay, so if I could just uh, ask two questions of clarification. Um, on the application that I've got before me, it obviously states that you'll be doing ID checks. I think you touch upon in your presentation, Mr. Fisher, that you'd be operating a Challenge 25. Can I just clarify that that is the case? Yes, it is. Okay. And also, for my understanding, in terms of the vicinity, you've obviously mentioned there that alcohol will only be sold on the premises and only be allowed in certain places. Can you just clarify for my understanding where about some, we, we saw a map in one of the objectors' uh, presentations. Can you just clarify whereabouts that alcohol will be permitted and more, more importantly, how far away it will be from the public park? Mr. Fisher? I think he's, uh, I think we lost him. I, if, you're, if you're okay, I mean, I can answer those, those questions. So just on the second point, where mm -hmm. the alcohol can be served is um, there's a defined area and we're going to have a plan in the building. So within, obviously within the, the community room where the bar will be, and then there's a patio area outside, which is about um, two and a half metres wide. And then it just stretches out towards the door. So it's a sort of a smallish area. Um, that will be fenced in and there'll be so the fence and there'll be signs on the fence just to define this is the only area that you can take drinks you're not allowed to actually take them onto the grass and the, the grassed area around the pitches so it is just within the boundaries of the pavilion and the sort of the patio area out the front um so what was what was the first question um well that kind of answers indirectly the, the last yeah, question yeah. i wanted to know how far away it was going to be from the playing field yeah it, it's it's literally seven paving slabs out and probably about 40 across so it's a small area in front of the pavilion it doesn't actually and there'll be a fence that stops you from then going onto the grass so it's a defined area okay thank you okay um thank you very much for that Chair, um yeah Chair, Chair, uh, yes uh, yeah it's council keeper and may i ask a couple more questions to the applicant please of course you can thank you sir um, we have Mr. Fisher on the call. No, unfortunately, uh, well, it's a, are you back, Simon? Uh, Chair, it's Sarah yeah. Baines here. Um, I've let Mr. Fisher back into the call, so he should be available. Thank you. Can you hear us, Mr. Fisher? My apologies. It, um, yeah, it came up, it was ended for okay. me, so. <laughs> Can't okay. over to you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, Mr. Fisher, as the applicant. Um, so um, I understand that the police have attended uh, the, the, the pavilion um, and you've been doing a, a deal of work between uh, both the police and yourselves. Uh, I saw that there was a list of uh, things that the, the police suggested or, or insisted in. I'm, I'm not, if you can provide some clarity or anyone can provide clarity if they're insisted on them. But was there anything on that list that you couldn't comply with? No, so we prior to the list being sent in, we agreed to all of them. Like I said, we added some things voluntarily as well, um, just because we wanted to go a little bit further in terms of some of the steps. Um, the only one that caused a concern, I think it might have been on the email trail, was around um, the locking away of the hard drive for the CCTV. Um, but we have actually managed to do that as well now. Um, at the time, it was agreed having it in the in a non-accessible space. Um, would be sufficient, um, but we've actually done both now. So again, we've tried to go above and beyond on that to make sure that we, we agree to that. But we, we've agreed to all of those steps on that. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, the other thing as well is um, uh, signs for when your patron, uh, potential patrons uh, leave the premises uh, whenever they choose to or whenever you close. Uh, you know, you always see the signs around pubs, especially in, in residential areas, uh, around the lines of, um, you know, please respect our neighbours. Um, can you confirm if you'll be having them around your venue and also um, will there be any uh, further away from your venue? Is, is that something you've considered? So in terms of away from the venue, um, similar with CCTV as it was raised earlier, we're not, the venue is, our venue, our lease is just the building. So we are not allowed without permission from the council, we are not allowed to put them up in the streets to the best of my knowledge. Um, we will certainly have um, signage everywhere that we can in terms of indoors and outside um, reminding people to be quiet because for us that's very important um, if there is an opportunity to, to support wider um, then we'll consider it but obviously that the rest of the remaining park is not our facility um, so that becomes slightly trickier and again same for the cctv we're allowed to put it on the building 
Um, we would love to put it in other areas of the park as well, um, near the entrance, etc., and and all the entrance next at six. Um, but we're not allowed to do that. I appreciate. It. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Um, my, my my final question is uh, along the four licensing objectives uh, uh, that, that, that the current policy um, uh, works to. Can you go through each licensing objective and just give us a summary, uh, in your own words, about how you intend to uphold them? I, I can do. Um, it might be. A, it could be a long answer. Um, so obviously, public safety. Um, for us, we've talked about earlier, um, only last week um, we've managed to pick up on the CCTV a group of youths that turned up and decided a good activity would be to throw glass bottles against the building, um, of which Craig, myself, or all four of the people involved in Chelsea and Leisure attended the next day to make sure we swept all of that up and cleared it away, having spoken to them over our loudspeaker that was outside to, to move the problem on. Um, it, but in terms of public safety, the, the building itself is it's council built so it's built to very high standards we've had it extended and modified again with a council improved contractor um, again to very high standards um, everything that's gone into it has been done professionally we've had a, um, a professional catering equipment professional kitchen equipment put in um, and, and, and again our role as part of that is to make sure that everything we do, whether that's through our contractors that we already pay for through our own fundraising for um, things like fire safety or um, alarm security, everything that goes into it has been money generated by us to be done professionally to make sure that building is as safe as it can possibly be. We've sat various exams um, as part of this outside of our day jobs um, around things like food safety, um, licensing. Um, we, we've, we've done that again to make sure that everything we do is done to the highest standards. For us, this is not a it's not a commercial business in the in traditional sense. It's something that we do in our spare time to raise money for the community. So therefore, we will do it above and beyond anything we ever need to do in terms of public safety. So creating a public nuisance, we, we've talked about that today. Our whole aim of what we're trying to do with the crossbar is to remove the public nuisance. We want to be able to take that away from the park. We've worked hard, as I talked about there again, with people throwing glass bottles. We've worked hard to try and remove those problems from the park. Our bar needs to be the thing that clears up the park, not creates the problem. I mean, that's the clearest thing. And that's why I say I think we are very aligned um, in many ways with, with the people that have raised the objections, because our goals and our, our what we are setting out to achieve are, are very, very similar to what they are looking for. Um, Projecting children, again, we, we've talked about no gaming machines, we've talked about no pool tables, um, all of those things are part of that initiative in terms of project, protecting children. We've talked about no glass outside, again, that will help to protect children. All those things were put forward by ourselves uh, as part of that. Um, we will have various different opportunities for children to be able to use the place. Um, we will have various different solutions for for, for children, for people that don't want to have a drink, for anything like that, there's soft drinks, there's coffees, there's food. Everything, again, will be set out very much from a fan, family-friendly option. Um, we have a, a choice of tables that are set out to, again, attract children to the place to be able to sit in a safe environment. Um, and, and having the, the 3G courts and the playing fields next to it is as safe as environment as we feel you could possibly put for a, a venue of this type. Um, and to prevent crime, again, we work incredibly closely with the police. As Craig's talked about, um, I have lost track of the amount of weekends that we've spent our time going up there through something we picked up on CCTV, something has been reported by the local neighbours to us. My phone is constantly going off with people reporting something from the local neighbours. We are ne nearly always the first to be there and we will then contact the police. Um, if you speak to the police, they, the most recent thing, they, the police officer came out who wasn't local and said, well, they have your details. And I said, just yes, believe me, they'll have my details from the amount of times I've reported stuff for things that have happened at this park. So. It's, it's absolutely. Again, our mission is to try and take away the crime and the bad behaviour at the park. So the, the park is investing in that. But again, that goes deeper than that. It's, it's how do we move away from drug taking and anything else that's going to happen inside the facility. Again, today's hearing is about inside the facility. We will not allow, we are not going after a clientele that are going to be 
bringing those problems and if they do bring those problems then they won't be welcome in our facility our facility needs to be as i said no drinks promotions no shots a family friendly venue thank you very much mr fisher thank you thank you chair thank you um thank you mr fisher for that presentation um i think it's over to you Anne. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I've got nothing extra to add now, um, apart from just pointing the uh, committee in the direction of point 1.4 for their options that are available to them today. Thank you. OK, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, Dominic, I think uh, we need to deliberate. So can you end the live stream, please? Uh, chair, um, to uh, do the... Uh...